question that I'd like to open this time with this morning. Are you ready for the question? You're, you're opening up your hearts. You're keeping an open mind. You're going to dig in. You ready? Do you trust me? Kind of. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Do you trust me? I heard a yes. I like the yes. I mean, that, that's an awkward question, isn't it? Do you trust me? Like, what for? Like, I'm, if I asked you to come up and like do a trust fall, you know what I'm talking about? Like, when you're like, except there's someone behind you to catch you, like, would you trust me with that? Sure, sure. Uh, I said, do you trust, what? Hmm? You would, I know you would. Get up to Sunday school. Uh, <laughs> trust me, that's the place you should be. Uh, would you trust me if I called you up in the morning and said, just don't turn on the TV today. Don't, don't turn on your computer, don't go on Facebook, don't anything, don't, like, don't look at the newspaper, don't turn on the radio, just, just don't ask, don't do it. Would you trust me with that? Some of you are like, yeah, sure. Some of you are like, Wait, why on earth would you do that? That's, how many people, if, if I was to call you up and say, just don't look at the news, don't, just whatever you do, don't turn anything on this morning, would you immediately be like, I don't want to go turn on the news and find out what Pastor Aaron is trying to keep me from knowing? Honestly, that, that would probably be my reaction if somebody called, told me. It would have to be a pretty special trust relationship for me to just say, okay. What if it was Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving happened a couple weeks ago, and there were two pies on the table, and one pie just looked amazing. The crust was perfect. It was, you know, look flaky, and you could... You could almost, you could smell it, you could almost taste the goodness coming after it. And it's your favorite kind of pie. I don't know what your favorite kind of pie is. Maybe it's apple or blueberry or another kind of pie. That's irrelevant to this discussion. And over here is pumpkin pie. Some of you like pumpkin pie, some of you don't like pumpkin pie. You're like, Bleh. and I'm like, trust me, you don't want this pie over here. You don't want this pie that's looking really good. Just just have the pumpkin pie. Some of you are like, no, I wouldn't trust you that the pumpkin pie is good. I know I don't like pumpkin pie. But would you at least not have the pie? I told you under no circumstances should you do this. Why not? What, what would you think? What would be the reason that I would tell you don't touch that pie? You would want to know why. Yes, you don't trust me enough just to take my word and say, don't... Okay, but so you want, you, you trust, but, but verify. <laughs> yes. What, 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 I heard someone say it, it was infected with whatever, sure. Infected I yeah, I saw who made it. They didn't wash their hands. Like, it, it, it may smell great, it may look great, but they left the bathroom, and it was not pleasant. Right? But you'd have no idea. Maybe I don't want to embarrass them at the table. <laughs> I'm just like, don't eat that. Or maybe I know that something slipped in there in the bag and there's a band-aid somewhere in there. You don't want to be the one to find it. Do you trust me? We're, we're going to be talking a bit about that this morning. Because you've got a relationship with me to a certain extent. I mean, sometimes I've been in most of your houses. We've, we've hung out some of us a bit. Some of us have talked about some really deep stuff. Some of us not so much. You know, you've heard me up here for, for a couple of years, some of you, and most of the time, I think, I haven't been wrong. Right? Like, I've, I've said stuff, and you've looked it up in your Bible and said, that passage was in the Bible. He did not just make that up. Right? So when I say this is in the Bible, most of you are just like, yeah, I trust you. You're not going, hold on, let me look this up on my phone or in my Bible. I want to know if Pastor Aaron is really quoting a real verse. Is Second Hezekiah really a book in the Bible? It's not. Just so you know, if, if I ever quote Second Hezekiah, it's not a thing. But we've got that trust relationship. 
we have a certain extent that it goes to. It might go to don't touch the pie. It might not go to never turn on the internet again. Okay? That's the relationship that we have. Here's Jesus sitting, standing. I don't know where he is at this point in the Sermon on the Mount, but there's a crowd of people around him. Some of them he has a relationship with. Some of them have been his disciples for a while. They've been following him. They've been uh, interacting closely. They've been relating with him. He shared these intimate parts of their lives. Some of them are people that have followed at a distance. And they've seen some miracles that he's done. They've seen him do some impressive things. They've seen him speak with wisdom. They've seen people they respect kind of respecting him. Although he started to say some weird things. He's got to be looking around this, this group of people, this varied group of people, and saying, do you trust me? Do you trust what I'm saying? When I tell you that everything you've gotten so far that's been handed down to you from your fathers and your fa their fathers in terms of how faith works, how the world works, what God's blessing looks like, when I tell you that's wrong, do you trust me? Would you trust me if I told you, never use that bait that you're, you're, you're really loving, Kale, that, that whatever lure, whatever bait you're using, don't do that. What I want you to do is just duct tape this to a hook and throw it in the water. You'd be pretty dumb to trust me on that one. I'm a useless fisherman, completely. But with Jesus, he's stepping up and saying, I am... Teacher, I am a teacher that is coming and giving you the words of life. And he said that all these things, these blessings, these ways of winning in the world that you thought were the way to get ahead, they're taking you in the wrong direction. And it's completely the opposite. He talked about how this law that was given that they thought was their way, their secret in to get with God, was not at all intended for that, was instead supposed to make them go on a trajectory that would show everybody else the way to God. Talked about the ways that they thought were scoring points were actually standing in the way of everything. Talked about how standing up to, to be seen and being respected as this great person of faith was all the reward they were going to get if all they were interested in doing was being seen as a person of great faith. But instead... The faith expressions that they had should be private between them and God. But the way they lived their life based on that connection with God should be public. It was upside down. It was, it was topsy-turvy. It was, it was messed up from what they thought. And now we're coming in this home stretch. We're coming in the home stretch. I want to throw up the, the message slide if that's working. There we go. My way or the highway. Have you ever heard that from someone, my way or the highway? Yeah. yeah some of you are, how do you react when someone says, it's my way or the highway? I see cringes. I see cringes. I saw somebody put their chin up a little bit. My way or the highway. It's a, he's, yeah, Daryl says it. He's like, it's the way it is. And you better believe it. And when you say that to me, I go, come at me, bro. <laughs> My way or the highway. That's, that's a confrontational statement. But this is the point in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus starts pivoting. And he stops being this nice guy, this nice teacher that maybe is trying to correct a bit of errant misunderstanding that they had. And he puts himself on a whole other level. And we're going to see that over the next few weeks as as we go through this uh, difference between telling them the path that they thought they were looking for is different and they should follow him along it, to saying, I get to say whether or not at the end of the path you're where you want to be. And that's a controversial statement. That's a... That's a big can of worms. As he says, guys, I've been telling you about this, and it's not just the best way. 
It's not just, you know, the way that God wants you to be. It is the way, period. There is no other way. It's my way or the highway. And you don't like where the highway goes. A lot of people, a lot of people get their backs up when Christians say that. They, they, it, it's abrasive. It's grating. I don't like to be, my way or the highway. Come, come at me, bro. This is not okay. Because I can picture the way that things should be. I can picture the way that my way would be. And gosh, it is, it is not the way Jesus is teaching. It's not the way all these, these rules and regulations and... This is a pain. And Jesus says it's this way or, or no way. The people that Jesus was talking to, they had really two extremes in their view of how faith is to be applied, how, uh, how the law works in, in their lives and in the whole world. And some of them were very much my way or the highway people. You know what? You can see this expressed in, in the faith of, of Christians all over the place today. People that would call themselves Christians. We're going to get to that in the next couple of weeks. Oh, that's going to get me in so much trouble. Okay, but I don't get in trouble today. That's great. Uh, maybe you know these people. Maybe you've, you've seen these people. There's the, the law is just for us people. And this could be expressed in, in people that would, uh, well, they'd, they'd say, your thing is your thing, my thing is my thing, right? I'm going to get to heaven my way. I'm going to have this relationship with God in, in this way. Christianity is for me. The rules are, are for me. They're not for you. You do, you know, what you want to do, and you'll be fine that way. Or it would be people that are like, those people with their evil whatever. Uh, you can insert whatever religion or people group that you want. It tends to be a pretty prejudicial statement. Those people are wrong. We are right. It's this tribal line, right? The law is ours. These people don't have it. On the other side, you've got these people that say, the law is for everybody. And they will go around and tell you exactly what you are doing wrong. Or they'll tell you the one thing that they think you're doing wrong that they're not doing. Because most of us feel a lot more comfortable pointing out the one flaw in someone else that we don't have rather than dealing with the flaws that we have in ourselves first. Jesus talked about that last time we were here. But they will say, you are going to hell, buddy. You got to get, these are the Ten Commandments. Which of these have you broken today? You might stand on the corner with a bullhorn yelling at people how they're going to hell and they need to get on the right way. Do things my way. Do things the way I think Jesus is saying. These are the two extremes, right? There's either the people who think, this, the, the religion, the faith, the, the relationship, the law, whatever it is, the way of living is, is mine. This is my personal faith that's going to get me to God. Or the people that say, everyone needs to do things exactly this way, period, and I'm going to let them know. It was the same thing back then. Have you ever tried to help someone who did not want to be helped? It, I see some nods. Do you know what I mean? That, like, the easiest way that I can think of uh, explaining this is I had a friend that did a lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. And I remember talking to him and being like, this is a terrible way to spend your money. This is, you're, you're going to get killed. You're going to, like, I, I'm not going to be... I, I'm not going to be friends with you anymore if you keep living your life this way. And he basically gave me the finger, and that was pretty much the end of our friendship. He did not want to hear from me 
the, the way he was living his life, the things that he enjoyed doing, the parties, the, uh, the drugs, the booze, everything that I watched him destroying his life with, that I think most people would agree were destructive things. He, he didn't want to hear, he wasn't like, oh yeah, Aaron, I trust you. Okay, cool, I'm, I'm going to put those things away. You, you know, I enjoy them, but you're right, I shouldn't be. Got his back up. And especially when I started dropping ultimatums, saying, we're not going to be friends if you keep doing that. I th I'm thinking he values my friendship so much that, that he's going to leave this life behind just to keep my friendship? Well, no. I was wrong. The ultimatum? Just put this fist up. Adversarial. You can't help someone that doesn't want to be helped. So here's Jesus trying to help people, right? Trying to tell them their understanding is topsy-turvy and upside down, saying, my way or the highway, guys? How do you think people react? I mean, we have the story. We have the story of how people react. He winds up on a cross. Which is why this, this section of the Sermon on the Mount is a little bit odd to me sometimes. I'm actually going to rewind a bit. I'm going to read the part that I read last week as well. It wasn't last week, it was like three weeks ago, so you probably don't remember anyway. But he started at verse 1 of chapter 7, Gospel of Matthew. This is coming down to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, I think you'll remember this, it's every, you know, partial Christian's, uh, every cultural Christian's favorite verse, do not judge and you will not be judged. He says, do not judge and you will not be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time you have this plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take this plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Right? You remember what that, that meant? That meant, hey guys, you can't measure your progress by putting other people down. You don't get farther on the road by knocking people backwards away. And he says, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample you under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You can't help someone that doesn't want to be helped. So you can't push people back farther down the road and make yourself look better. But if you try to tell people that this is the road they must be on, and they're not ready to hear that, if they're not looking for the way to the road already, they're not going to be impressed with you sitting down and telling them, oh, which Ten Commandments did you break today? Which, whatever, this is the way you got to live. They'll turn around and say, enough with you. I'm going to live my way. You say my way or the highway, I choose the highway. <coughs> it's good practical advice here. You kind of wonder if, if Jesus took his own advice there, whether he'd wind up on the cross. So that's exactly what happened to him. He came and told them, this way that you're living is wrong, it's messed up, it's backwards. This is the way you need to go. They put him on the cross. And I talked a few weeks ago about how in your Bibles you'll often have these little headers that kind of separate things off. And in my Bible, that first part says judging others. And that goes from do not judge right down to tear you to pieces. And then there's this break and it says ask, seek, knock. And Jesus carries on and he says ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks will have the door opened for them. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, know you are evil, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And I hate that little break there, where it says, ask, seek, knock. Because every time I hear this verse quoted, ask, and it will be given to you, seek, and you shall find, knock, and the door will be open. It's people thinking, you know, all I have to do is ask God for stuff, and I'll get the stuff. 
But that, that little header wasn't there. What it said was, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it shall be given to you. One thought. All the way through. So what do these two things have to do with each other? The law. The commandments. The way that Jesus is showing. They're good things. I, I, I don't know how to, how to make that more simple. <laughs> Saying the law is not hidden. It's not set apart for the good and special people. But more than that, it's not something that you can force someone into. There is no way that you can grab someone, throw them on the path to the kingdom of heaven, and drag them there. It doesn't work because the kicking and screaming they will go the other way. But ask and you'll receive. Ask and you'll receive. Seek that path and you'll find it. Knock on the door to heaven and it will be open to you. If you are looking for the way, Jesus says, I can show you. It's there. It's right here for you people. And it's good. Who of you, if you... If your kid asks for bread, would give him a stone. That's silly. That's crazy. Except that's how a lot of people look at the law. That's how a lot of people look at, at the way that God's giving us to live in the Bible that says live in this other's first way. It says you should be poor in spirit and mourning and peacemakers and persecuted on this path, that doesn't sound good. I have to give up my drugs and my, my partying and my drinking and what, what else do I have to give up in here? What else do I have to not do? Right, that's, that's how a lot of people read this. That's how I read this a lot of the time. It's a list of don'ts. It's a list of don'ts so that I don't have fun here in this world, that I don't do what I want to do that I enjoy doing, and maybe I can trade that in someday for something good. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that so that you can get to here. Who, if your kid asked for a fish, would give you a snake? Why do we treat this? Why do we treat God's way? Why do we treat the way that Jesus has called us to walk and the way that Jesus has called us to live, how, to follow in his footsteps and say, wow, what a crappy gift, God. What a boring, lousy way to live. Fine, I'll do it if I have to. The law, the commandments, God's, God's rules, they're, they're good things. They're not impositions. It's not about, I need to give up this, this good stuff out here so I can get to the, the good place later, right? He saw who made the pie. He saw whether they washed their hands or not. He saw whether the band-aid that was there at the beginning was still there when they were done making the pie. Saying these things can look good. And maybe they might taste good, but if you knew where they came from, if you knew what was going on, you would not want this inside your body. You would not want this passing your lips. Jesus is saying, this path to the kingdom that I'm showing you, this is good. There is joy on here. As you walk this path with the good shepherd, you are walking through pleasant streams, like the clear waters and, and, and green pastures. And you know what? Sometimes that path to the kingdom of God is going to walk you through the shadow of death. But every step of the way, he promises to be with us. What does David say? I love, I love this, uh, this passage. It's, it's a little bit weird to our ears to say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We read that earlier. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know what a shepherd's rod and staff were 
maybe you do, maybe you don't. The rod was there to keep away the enemies. It was there to keep away, it was a weapon. The staff was there to whack the sheep. To keep them going in the way that was good. And it is comforting to know that these things that, that look good sometimes to us are destructive. And if we avoid them, we are not missing out. That's the promise. That God is guiding us in good ways and we are going to have joy and we are going to have comfort in his presence. The kingdom path is good and it's better than the path to the world, even if, if at first glance it might seem bland. The reason is because the shepherd is on that path. Jesus said, come to give you life, and life to the fullest. Not shrinking little, just stay away from this because this, oh, this sucks, but I'm going to hold on. He's given us a path to run. There is joy there. It's good there. And Jesus says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? When I say that this stuff is bad and this stuff is good, even if at first glance it seems hard, even if at first glance it seems like giving up myself and my way for other people, giving up myself and my right to whatever, even if it seems like that is hard, even if it seems like that means you're going to give up something, that what you get, the Spirit of God welling up inside you is so much more. Do you trust me, he says. What I love is that he does not stop there. There's a lot more that comes after this. Some of it's even harder than what he's saying here. But the piece that comes after this Sermon on the Mount, the piece that comes after this teaching, is him living life in relationship with humanity. It's him walking the kingdom path through the valley of the shadow of death, the cross and then beyond. Resurrected, living again after dying as proof positive that his word is true. He is the son of God. Do you trust me? Do you trust me based on what you have seen? We talked at the beginning. I said, do you trust me, Pastor Aaron? Do you trust me based on the relationship that we have? Do you trust me based on how you've seen me live my life? Do you trust me based on the knowledge that I've shown? Jesus says, do you trust me based on the fact that I gave up my life for you, that my blood was shed for you just like I said, that I died on the cross just like I said I would, and more than that, just like I said, after three days, rose to life again. The down payment on your eternal life. Do you trust me? So as we, as we close up today, as we move towards our, our ending song, take some time and just think. Is there something that you are not trusting God with? Is there something that you feel like you've come across or he's laid on your heart that you've said, that seems off, that seems wrong, that's not my way. Maybe you got your back up. Maybe you feel like something I can't accept. I don't want to accept. Do you trust him? Do you trust Jesus that the next step that he's called you to is good? Just close your eyes and think about that.